I'm a city architect, and I've, like Chris, been working on this uh, on this project for more than four years, and um, I have uh, really seen it come a long way. And what I what I wanted to do tonight was step back a little bit and uh, answer some very specific questions that are still out there. Uh, the first question being, uh, why does the pier need to be replaced? And the second question I'm going to answer, or start to answer, is uh, why can't it be put back just the way that it is today? And once I get, over, get go through those two uh, subjects, and I'll turn it over to, to Jason, and he'll share with you specifics about the lens. But but it was uh, important to, to kind of look at the, the history. Uh, um, so the, first of all, the, the, the history of recreational piers in St. Petersburg, or, or, or recreational piers in general, date back to the Victorian era. And a pier in the Victorian era was more than just a, a bridge. It was either a bridge or a building. It was a kind of a, a unique thing. Brian, you're going to have to run. All right, there you go. Um, and the, first, the city's first pier, so we'll step back a little bit, was the railroad pier, which was at the end of First Avenue South. And it was built in 1889 and replaced in 1906. Um, and the city's uh, second pier was uh, the Brandon Pier, and it was built in 1896, and it lasted nine years. And the city's um, electric pier replaced the Brandon in about 1905, and it also only lasted nine years. So the point of this is that ultimately uh, Mother Nature is going to decide how long uh, these piers last. The entire bridge and head that supports uh, the pier that we have today was built in 1925, and it was open to the public in 1926, so soon it will be 90 years old, and there are very few 90-year-old structures over water uh, in Florida. Uh, the pier is constructed on cast-in-place, reinforced concrete beams, girders, and slabs. Uh, and that's what we call a superstructure, and it's on top of precast reinforced concrete piles. So I'll take a, a quick look uh, underneath the pier that'll explain uh, exactly uh, what needs to be replaced. What's happened is due to chloride intrusion from the salt water and the active corrosion of the reinforcing steel, the pier superstructure has deteriorated, deteriorated causing a decreased capacity of those beams and slabs. So that corroded steel essentially expands and it cracks or spalls the concrete. And tests have shown that high chloride concentrations exist well inside past repairs, indicating that these repairs provide no long-term protection of the reinforcing steel. By re repairing the pier by applying uh, gunite or cement patches really does nothing to stop the corrosion or increase the load carrying capacity of the bridge. And here's an example of what's happened over the years. The gunite patches have spalled off and basically uh, exposed the reinforcing steel again. So the deterioration of the structure, of the superstructure, is irreversible and it would only get worse. That corrosion due to salt water intrusion cannot be stopped. And in 2003, a consulting engineer determined that the city is fighting a losing battle by trying to repair the structure and should instead start planning for the replacement of the bridge and head. The, uh, the 1973 inverted pyramid was designed to minimally impact the base of the 1925 pier structure. It was essentially built on top of the, the 1925 structure on its own foundation. So that separate foundation is, a, is essentially four 20 by 20 caissons which have never been fully tested, and it's a roughly 60 by 60 foot area right in the center of the pier. Now that building is uh, 40 years old, and it requires extensive renovations and code upgrades, and it's practically all of its building systems need to be replaced. So it's going to be a, need to be a complete, complete gut if it were to be renovated. Uh, again, the area around the inverted pyramid building where all the shops and the food courts are was built also on top of the 1925 structure, and it must be replaced. Uh, the only remaining portion of the ground floor is that roughly 60 by 60 foot uh, area bounded by the stairs and the elevator cores that serve the upper floors of the inverted pyramid, which is the area shown in yellow. 
and this is all that would be left on the ground floor once all of the, deterior, the deteriorated portions of the pier are demolished. Those portions that, that were built in 25 that are failing because of the salt water intrusion all need to be replaced. This is all that would be left. So the other question is, you know, why can't we save the inverted pyramid and rebuild the bridge and head exactly the way it is today? And for a complete understanding of that and explanation of that, really we need to go back to 1921. And back then, St. Pete had, again, several working recreational piers. And this is the, the municipal pier, the city's first publicly owned pier, which replaced the electric pier in 1914. You'll see for the first time, there were actually automobiles driving on the pier. In 1921, St. Pete was hit by a fairly massive hurricane, and many of those working piers were uh, destroyed. Uh, the municipal pier was badly damaged, and it was repaired, as you see here in this photograph, and reopened in 1922. Uh, what we also need to understand is, is, is what was happening, not just in St. Petersburg, but uh, in the state of Florida and the nation as a whole in the 20s. In Florida, as many of you know, was a uh, land of opportunities and you know so the, the roaring 20s and you know people were starting to move to Florida at the beginning of 1920 the population in St. Petersburg was 14,000 people by 1926 when the pier was built and opened the population was 30,000 and of those there were about 6,000 who were real estate agents so you can see St. Petersburg was all about getting people to move down to uh, move down here and expanding it was this huge Florida boom that was going on there was another significant development in the 20s, which was the uh, introduction of uh, the, really the automobile going from something that was more of uh, you know, the Model T's to a, a basic car that was available to everybody, which is now a reliable and affordable automobile. Also, in 1924, the Gandhi Bridge was built. And in 1920, St. Petersburg, for the first time, started to build roads. It was a $12 million bond issue that was spent in the 1920s building roads in St. Petersburg, just to kind of give you a feel for what was going on. The middle class tourists, for the first time, were really beginning to drive to Florida. So to put this into context, what better way to capture that spirit of the roaring 20s and lure tourists to our city than to build this Mediterranean Revival Casino 1,400 feet out in Tampa Bay? Again, this is 1926, roughly 30,000 people living here. And it was the, the automobile that made it possible to build a casino that we fondly remember as a million dollar pier. And we all know that it was uh, world famous and, and the fact that it was extraordinary can't be disputed. But you know, the, the, the distance over water was no longer an obstacle, but it was an opportunity to drive and display the automobile. So that, that million dollar pier was designed with the automobile in mind. It's a 100 foot wide pier bridge with four lanes of traffic, two lanes of parking, and a center lane for an electric car, an electric streetcar. The pier we have today is a direct extension of the 1920s automobile-centered design. The commercialization of the terminus of the pier is a product of the ability to, to drive by a car. And if you didn't have the ability to drive out there, you probably wouldn't have it be as, a, as much of a commercial draw. And again, back to the original Million Dollar Pier, it wasn't heavily commercialized with shops and restaurants when it was first built. It was essentially a trolley barn. It had a central atrium. It had uh, an open air ballroom. Uh, it had community gathering spaces. The radio station, WSUN, was added a little bit later. And in the, uh, the mid-80s, uh, downtown St. Pete, and by extension, the pier was, was suffering from a declining economic condition. Um, the pier's isolation uh, and the need to recapture that tourist market in the 80s led to the decision to redevelop get the pier into this festival marketplace, which opened in 1988 with those ground floor shops and the glass elevator and food court, which was built on top of that 1925 structure. So we, uh, we step now all the way forward to 2012, and there's this indisputable need to replace the nearly 90-year-old bridge that supports the pier and all of the ground floor retail. That fact we've pretty much determined. It has to be replaced. 
the question is why can't we put it back the same way that it was, uh, the way that it is today? So in addition to the fact of putting it back exactly the way it is, ex exactly the way it is, exceeds our $50 million budget, the question is should we hold on to this, uh, this 1920s model and devote our limited resources to, peer, to build a peer design around the automobile or transform it into a peer that's designed for people? And another fact, over 80% of that current pier is dedicated to vehicular use. That's nearly 200,000 square feet, which is essentially this, this large funnel for the collection of oils, petroleum products, nutrient pollutants, and other toxins that dump directly into the bay. By eliminating all the cars and trucks that are parked daily on this bridge, it eliminates this major source of uh, pollutants. This reduced footprint of the, of, the, of the reduced footprint of the lens concept, which is about 160,000 square feet compared to 240,000 square feet total of the current pier, is a significant reduction in cost and also a reduced environmental impact to the bay bottom. Uh, the pier's economic model is also unsustainable. Uh, commercializing the terminus has failed to generate sufficient revenues to offset its costs. For a mall to be financially uh, viable, it needs a larger critical mass and a mix of the right tenants. Uh, once it's demolished, none of those existing ground floor shops and support spaces would be added back. It's not in the budget to do that. Um, again, you, you can debate the aesthetics and the worthiness of the renovation, but one thing that's not uh, disputable is that after the demolition, renovating the inverted pyramid does not solve the, uh, the retail inefficiencies which require uh, significant annual taxpayer subsidies.